Um, good morning, everyone, for this Monday morning. Windy, windy Monday morning. Maria's been winded in and blown in from Marrakesh, direct and live. <laughs> um, and she'll be telling us some of her stories. And I think once she's she's finished what she's going to say, her story, she wants to do a bit of a, a relaxation therapy bit. All yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So it's up to you whether you stay for that or you, you know you want to go um but feel free to use the chat and ask any questions and we'll do our best to answer them so are you ready maria i am indeed i'm ready ready willing and can't wait to start so um i see lovely happy smiling faces from my story family clan Skelta, the story family i see sharon and nula people that i know who are also fine tellers mm -hmm. so today we're going to be looking at um what what is the nourishment of stories what is the bit of stories that gives us an uplift so i'm a great believer in the chat and i have the chat here right next to me and i can see everything so i've, I've all the wonderful tech so what I'm wondering, and maybe you can just put post some of your thoughts in here, is what is it about stories that uplifts you? What is it? Because sometimes it's nice to think of that for ourselves. So who last told you a story? Did the story come in the form of a film or a book or the human voice or meeting someone in the supermarket? Because now we can do that again. <laughs> You know, so what is it about stories that uplifts you? And I'll be watching the chat here for when the for when things come in. And if you have a little pencil next to you, jot it down as we're going along. Why do I say that? Because we are facets of a diamond. Intelligence is only one part of us. We also have a physicality. We have a command of language. We're emotional beings. We're social beings. We're spiritual beings. So when I ask this question of you, very often it's the heart that answers, not just the intelligence. And that's lovely. So I'm asking you that question so we can hear your hearts, your hearts and your souls. What do they like about stories? And Mandy says that um, Suzanne is the last storyteller she heard. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm just back from Marrakesh where we had a feast of stories. Some of the stories weren't in English, but I loved them anyway. The music of the language and the way the stories were delivered meant that it was meaningful to me, even though I didn't know what the words meant. So what is it like for you? Sharing experiences, absolutely. Story is a way of sharing experiences. The storytelling world will tell you that you can tell a story to 30 people and 30 versions of that story will go out into the world. And when it's retold, then 30 more versions of that story will go forward. We've seen this in stories like the Kylock, She's claimed by Scotland, by Ireland, by the UK. Now I've heard UK tellers talk about her. And this was like the mother nature of the Celtic tradition and Kylock. So I'm able to bring in some of the words as we have this little, um, this little chat. Yes, the, Mar the Marrakesh festival um, was like a connection or a memory on someone's face the ability to transport someone to another place and time. Look at the power of story. Look at the power of story. You can transport someone to another place and time. You can go backwards in time. You can go to the time that never happened. There's so much. And there is a reason that we say words are spells. Words are spells. They're able to change a situation. I'm sure you've been talking to a young person in your life and they've said, oh, everything is whatever, dot, dot, dot. And you've been able to say, well, in my experience and through words, give them the benefit of your experience. 
you know so there is there is um there is a magic in words so what i wanted to uh, do with you this morning was something that i've been doing all the way throughout covid we've had lovely clan scale storytelling families being built through this platform so before uh, covid would have happened i'd have never sat in front of you like this and said can we connect but now i know we can you know so one of the ways of connecting is to build a story and so i'm going to give you the tools to build a story and maybe at the end of this session you will have a story yourself you know and and we've been we've been making these stories in marrakesh for the last week and magical stories have come out of this mechanism the mechanism be, belongs to a drama therapist called muli lahad who is from israel and he treats people in trauma with this mechanism he for example after the tsunamis he was one of the first responders to treat with story the trauma that had happened so here we go with the first part so the most important thing is to be as relaxed as you can to feel your feet on the ground to feel the chair holding your body to be aware of your breath and how it comes in and out and how it keeps your heart pumping and in this space allow your mind to wander allow a space to open up in your internal world that only you can see and into this space allow a character to come in let a character walk into your space and we're just welcoming Carol now. She's just a, she's just arrived in. Hello, Carol. We're just talking story. When you come in, when you see this character, because you have total control, you're the magician of your inner world where everything is possible. So you freeze that character and walk up to that character and look into the eyes of that character. How are they feeling today? How do you know by just looking at them? What are they wearing? How old are they? Ask yourself, how do you know this? Name your character. So that's the first part of the story. You name your character. I'm going to share with you the latest six part story that we did. And so there was, it was, a, the character was a gin. I was thinking, this is amazing. Are we in a pub? They said, no, a gin over in this country means a devil. And I was, oh my God, that's amazing. That's never been the first character in my story before, you know? And then I asked them, what are the top three qualities? of your character. So you've decided on your character now. You've named your character. And now give them three qualities. Three qualities that make them visible in the world. Are they kind? Are they cranky? Are they happy? What do they offer the world? What are their three characters? Three qualities of this character. Our Jin was um, uh, absolutely amazing at getting everybody to look at him. That was his main characteristic. I thought that was amazing. So when he would come into a room, everybody would look at him and he was confident. He liked being looked at. So that was his second quality. He was a confident gin. And his third quality was that he liked to sing and make everybody else sing as well. And so wherever he went, people sang, even if they didn't feel like they wanted to sing. So that was our gin. So I wonder what your characters are. And if we had time, I'd love to explore that, but we won't have time this morning. So we might have to gather again 
and go into our little breakout rooms and work together to make a story. But not this morning. This morning, we're giving you the mechanism. So the second part of the story, we put this all out of our minds now so that we can clear the space. And now we have a clear space in our internal world. And in our internal world, we allow ourselves to land in an environment. What does it feel like under your feet in this place? Is it indoors or is it outdoors? Is it warm and cozy or is it cold and windy? Can you smell things in this environment? When you close your eyes and stand in this place in your bare feet, what do you feel under your feet? Are there sounds here? What can you hear in this environment? And then you name your environment. The environment for our gin, very foreign to myself before last week, is the souk. A souk is like a big market. There is goats and chickens and sheep wandering around freely. There's people calling for their wares. There's loads of sales going on. There's food and scarves and bags. You can buy anything here from a pin to an anchor, anything at all. And it's full of life, pulsating. And it's very hard to get any kind of attention in this place because everybody is shouting for attention. So this was the environment. It smelt hot. It was very warm. There was people bustling. So you had to pull your elbows in. That was the environment that they came up with. I'd love to know your environments. What environment did you find in yourself in, in your mind's eye? And so your story begins to take shape. Now your character finds themselves in this environment. But because they're finding themselves in this environment, we give them a special power. What is their special power? What is the first thing that came into your mind when I said that? Let it be the first thing. Let it be your gut reaction. Our Jin, his special power was to be able to read minds. But it came with a price. Because if you can read minds in a busy place, all you can hear is all around you. And it's very, very hard to concentrate on just one. And it was giving him a headache. And all he wanted was silence. But the souk is not a silent place. When your character finds themselves in that environment, how do they feel? Are they part of this environment? Do they love being here? Or do they need this special power that we'll be giving them anyway, whether they're comfortable or not? And what was the special power that you gave your character? Mm -hmm. Armed with this special power, our character makes their way into the environment and then they realize that they have a mission. Someone might give them the mission or they might feel it in their heart like a calling, but they have a reason to be here. They have a reason that they need to be in this environment. What's that reason? What is their mission? What is their raison d'etre in this particular story? Only you know, because you are putting this story together. In the story of the Jinn, his mission was to find out if there was a plot to blow up the souk. Dun, 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 dramatic. And they knew that there would be one person in all of these hundreds of people that would have a bad intention but they did not know who it was. And our Jin had a problem. He could not use his gift with all of the people that were there. Which brings me to the next part of our story. 
your character has a mission. But someone or something or some act of God stops or interrupts them in their way towards completing the mission. For our jinn, it was that he could hear too many voices at the one time. What is it for your character? What's the interrupter that threatens to derail their mission? In the next part of the story, we look at what might help our hero in their journey. It can be someone, it can be something, it can be an act of God, it could be an act of nature that allows them to come back on track. It doesn't solve the mission because that is the job of our hero, but it shows that we can ask and receive help. We can ask for and receive help. And that help can come in many different ways. So how does your character get help? Our Jin had a young woman that he could hold her hand. And when he held her hand, only the person that she looked at would be able, he would only be able to read their mind. So it zoned everybody else out. And when he held her hand, only the person that she was looking at, that was the only thoughts that he could hear now. So it was amazing by holding hands with someone else, by getting help from someone who was way seen in the world as way down the ladder from him. Now he was able to do what he needed to do. And she looked here and she looked there. And then down at the far end of the souk, she spotted the other gin, the gin with bad intentions. So what was it like for your character to receive help? How did it manifest? And how did the help happen? We all need help from time to time. It's important to know how to ask. And sometimes it's much easier to be the one that gives the help than the ones that receives the help. An old Irish saying says, it's a great gift to receive well. It's a great gift to receive well, because when you do, you lift the heart of the person who's given you that gift. So now we're coming almost to the end of the story. We have had something that's interrupted the mission. We've had something that helps the mission. And now we need to know how the story ends. This is entirely up to you. Do you want to be the, this to be the end of a chapter? Is this going to turn into a beautiful book that I will see on the shelves of all of the bookstores in the UK and Ireland and France and Germany? Or is this a little story where this is the end now, the end, the end of the story, and it gets wrapped up in a beautiful ribbon? There is only one rule. You can't say the end and you can't say this is the end of the chapter. So how do you let your listeners know or your readers, if you turn this into a writing, how do you let them know that this is the end of the chapter or the end of the story? That's a skill. In our story of the jinn, that I'm using for demonstration purposes. It was that the two jinns faced off, our jinn holding the hand of the girl, the jinn on the other end, he could see that holding hands made the difference. He tried to hide, but he couldn't. Every move he tried to make, this jinn was able to read how he would plant his foot, how he would put his hand, he knew the thought in his head before he could even think it. 
before long, the two jinns met face to face and he said, I can't, I can't play with you because you have a secret weapon, the heart of a good woman. So that was the end, a beautiful sentence. You have the heart of a good woman, nothing more to be said. And that was the end of the story. And so you might have a little story now or the start of a story, the start of a story. And maybe you can work on this story. When we're working on this story, just ask yourself, while I was making that story, could I see the pictures in my head? Was I able to answer the questions sitting at home with my pencil in my hand in a relaxed state? And if the answer is, it took me a while to get into it, then we know that maybe we need to lie on the floor for 10 minutes before we try to make a story. Maybe we have to play some beautiful music. I find that when I'm making a really important soul story that I go out into nature, I like to take it for a walk. My friend Sharon Dixon knows this very well. I take my stories for a walk and then you might, you might feel something in the wind or you might touch something on the back of a tree that will add to your story. When you're a storyteller, the whole world is your instrument. The whole world are your colors, your crane box to play with and your own voice, your heart. That is the instrument by which you bring the story into the world. So I would like to tell you a story that I made like that. Sometimes we have um, we make stories together, you know, and some some of you have already made stories with me before and it's lovely. And, and some of those stories have gone out into the world and become stories that have been already passed on from one to the other. And sometimes it's important to take yourself for a walk and allow yourself to go through a story in your head. And then if it's right, if it feels right for you, you can share that story. So I'm just going to have a little check in the chat to see if there is anything that I need to come in to not at the moment because you're all busy with your pencils which is amazing and i hope that you have beautiful stories and wouldn't it be great if we had another session and we heard those stories from you i'd love that please send in your stories and here's my story so this story was um was a story uh, that that came over i'll tell you the story and it'll speak for itself there was a woman and her name was Nora and she was really happy. She lived in a village and she had long red hair and she had beautiful skin and a man who loved her and she loved him. And the whole village thought Moira, sorry, her name was Moira, thought Moira had a great life and they thought nothing ever gets her down. She had a little garden and she grew her own herbs and they were always fat and succulent and yummy. And she had goats and chickens and her house was paid for. But you know, and I know, that life is never perfect. And deep in her heart, she carried a short, sharp little secret, a little stone at the bottom of her heart because she wanted a little baby of her own, a baby to kiss, a baby to croon to, a baby to sing to, a baby to share the little yellow room that she prepared with a cot in the corner and a little rocking chair so that she could sing songs to the baby and mobiles from the ceiling that she'd made herself but that baby never came. 
Moira was a woman of the knowing, a ban fassa. She knew what it was to watch na nature and she had an anam kara, a soul friend. This soul friend was a fox and when that fox came, Moira's husband knew that she would be going out to see that little fox no matter what else was going on. A look, a look would come over her face and he knew that look and he knew she'd be leaving. One morning, a morning very like the weather we're having now, there was a magic mist building itself around the garden and Moira sat bolt upright inside in the bed. Her husband, well used to this kind of behaviour, just turned around and went back to sleep. But Moira, she ran down the stairs, pulled on her jacket and her wellies, opened the door and ran out to where the little, little fox was waiting. She bent down and looked into the eyes of the fox, for that's how they communicated. And then something happened that had never happened before. Her spirit rose up out of her body, floated through space, and her right hand went into the right paw of the fox, and her left hand went into the left paw of the fox. And then she lined up her eyes behind the eyes of the fox until they were one. The fox rose and padded gently towards the bank of the river and stuck its long fox tongue into the river. She could taste now like she had never tasted before. The lavender, the garlic, and a salmon that had swum here only 10 minutes before. She was very aware of the sheep up in the right hand field and knew that they knew that she was around too. She could feel the fear of the chickens on the left hand side, but she wasn't interested in chickens today. The fox got up and padded gently into the forest, their forest, and to their tree. And then at the bottom of the tree, where she had never seen it before, she saw a little hole. It felt that it was too small for this fox, but the fox squeezed its body in and they began to travel down, down into the warm, beautiful, musty earth. And as they traveled, she saw 12 stars. Stars underground, she said. That's not possible. Then she laughed at herself. She was traveling in the body of a fox. <laughs> Anything was possible. Soon she realized that these 12 stars were six pairs of eyes for on Madra Rua, the fox had given birth. <gasps> Moira's heart felt full and her back went up against the lair as the little cubs gave her a mother's welcome, pushing her over, licking her neck, taking mother's milk. And she realized that if anyone, anyone stood between her and these fox cubs, they'd have something to pay. With that realization, she knew, she knew what it was to be a mother. And the fox, satisfied, stood up, shook herself off and padded up again to where the opening was in the tree and back to the garden where the mist had cleared and everything was now clear. She could see her own body as if in a reverie, standing over the hawthorn bush. And with that, her spirit rose from the fox body and back into her own. Oh, Oh, thank you, thank you, my Anam Kara, she said. Thank you, my little fox friend. But the fox stood and looked at her and wouldn't let her go. I know, she said, I know what I must do. 
and she ran into the house pulling off the wellies and taking off the coat as she ran up the stairs into the yellow room she went taking it apart down came the mobile into the cot all of everything she could gather into the cot it went and she slid it down the stairs then she asked her husband to bring out that long piece of wood that she'd been keeping she hadn't known why but she knew now she made a big long desk the whole length of the room and then she bought the best art materials she could and she invited all the children of the village in oh they could do things there that they couldn't do at home they could say things like fart <laughs> And they could play with one another and they could paint and they could draw and they could have great times. We're going to Mara Ruiz, Mom. We're going to Mara Ruiz. Time passed and she became Shan Wahir Leah, the grey haired grandmother. And she began to go to the weddings of those children. And when she did, she'd take a piece of their art and frame it and give it to them as the great gift from their childhood. Those pictures hang on all of the houses of the little village. Moira Rua learned, you do not have to give birth to be a mother. And the village learned, it takes a whole village to raise a child. So that is a story that came from this mechanism. If you listen to the wind, then these stories can come with you as well. And I feel a lot of privilege in that story and that it came through me, but belongs to everybody. So the stories might come through you, but the stories are for everybody. So that's Myra Rua. So I'm just going to have a look at the chat now if there's any questions you'd like to ask me now is the time to ask before we go to the next little piece okay so i'm not seeing any questions coming in at the moment but i'm keeping an eye on the chat and if they come in i'll answer them so now that we've made once now that we've played with the mechanism of the six part story and it's really quick and I'm really conscious of that because in these little clan Stelte, in these little storytelling families that we've had over uh, this strange time, then you could spend a whole day just working on the character. There's so much richness in that and a whole day on each piece. And then you would have um, a part where you polished your story and then there would be the performing of the story. So it's very different to squash it down into one hour and I hope you've enjoyed playing with the strings of the bow of the six part story but now let's look at story and resilience and how it gives us resilience a long long time ago over 2000 years ago in the cradle of humanity back in Greece they had a word called catharsis a word that enabled an idea to be born. And catharsis says that you could have had the worst day possible. You could have had a rotten old day. You could have been shouted at by your boss, by your children. You could have been yeah! by the cat, you know. Um, and then you read a book or you watch your favorite soap on TV or you have a chat with a friend and even though nothing changes, even though nothing changes, in fact, everything has changed in your spirit. Your spirit is lifted. This is called catharsis. And stories is a great mechanism of catharsis. It's a great vehicle for catharsis. So you can either allow yourself to wander in your own internal world knocking on the doors of the characters and the environments and the missions to see how they can give you that cathartic lift 
or you can meet someone and say, do you know what happened to me yesterday? Because that's a story too. And you can tell them. And in the sharing of your own personal story, something happens to your heart. Your heart is lifted. Your spirit is lifted. So this is catharsis. And I attended Catherine Souter Caddick's art um, uh, session, which was the last session to be held here, Creativity After C19. That's like COVID-19. And it was amazing because I was getting ready for Marrakesh and the pressures were coming in. Did I have my passport? Do I have enough clothes? Have I enough stories for this wonderful place? And then I came in and I had the cathartic effect of being able to play with art and to get out of the clench that can happen in our brains, you know, because we take a stance. We take a stance in life. We say things like, I am, I am a, ma a mother. I am mammy in this place. I am. And with that, you take on a role. You take on a role. And sometimes it's nice to slip out of that role because it's not all that you are. So in the Irish language, we say that something is on us. Tan ochris orum. The hunger is on me, but we know that it's only on me. It's not me. In the English language, we say I am hungry, which means there's nothing else in life at the moment, but the fact that I am hungry. So how you tell a story can be as important as what you tell. You know, so um, do you say your character is all consumed with something or do you say your character is observing this and this is how the character is feeling because that allows us to look at ourselves and our our, our own way in life you know our uh, am i you know am i all consumed with one thing at the moment and i was in the lead up to marrakesh so taking a morning out to do something nourishing with people that I'm so fond of, like Catherine Souter Caddick, that that gives you a side door out to rest your spirit, to rest your heart, because the mind will will stay there to the bitter end. <laughs> but our heart needs sometimes something else, and so do our spirit. So storytelling is a way of doing that. And, and as a drama therapist, it's a privilege to see the unfurling happening. So life can clench us, you know, and then stories can unfurl us. And in stories, you can be anything. Uh, there was a big debate uh, here in Ireland um, just a, a little while ago on how uh, the stories like Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty um, are very bad for for feminism and for women, you know, and I had to get involved in those stories. And I said those stories were not like that in the in their original form when Grimm told those stories or, you know, kind of as they are told now by Clarissa Pinkola Estes, women who runs with wolves because she goes to the original version. Someone changed those stories someone disnified those stories and that was important for the time that they were changed it was so they could be understood in that time but stories are shape shifters so if you don't like a story change the story make cinderella the tree climbing heroine you know who rescues the prince why not you know so that also gives us a permission in our own lives so if you're the person who can't say no and you're saying i am the person who can't say no and you're adopting that role of the person that can't say no then sit in your little room with your candle lie on the ground and think who is the person who always says no and how can i channel a bit of that for myself <laughs> because you don't have to be the I am, you can be the I want to be.
you can be the I'm going to be. So let's see. At this point, I often bring in my audience and we have a chat, but I'm conscious that this is being recorded. So if you would like to come into a chat with me, but you know that your face is going to flash up on the uh, on the screen, you can either stop video, you'll still be able to see us and hear everything and join in or you can um, you can just let me know and then I can bring you in. So for now, if you could uh, maybe put up your hand and I can bring you in, that would be great just to oh Susie hello Susie so Susie I'm just going to pin you there hiya Susie how are you and I'm going to ask you to unmute there we go hiya Susie thank you for coming in I really appreciate it you know um so have you a question to ask or an observation to make yes I really enjoyed it actually oh <laughs> good yeah did, did a little story begin to unfurl for you as we were going yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, I think it was inspired by your background, actually. Oh, brilliant. You see, I love that. It was that. in the forest. Yeah. Yeah, so your eyes are great vehicles then. You you come in with, you know, the visuals kind of um, give you a little hint. There, yeah. Therefore, I think it would be really good for you to take a story walk and just go through the mechanism again because, you you know, you're visual, which is lovely, you know. Um, is there a particular uh, piece of uh, the resilience of story that I was talking about that sat with you, you know, um, after the mechanism? Yeah, I think that it's a really important tool actually to share experiences like that. Yeah. You know, I work with children and I'd like us to sort of tell our own stories a bit more rather than looking yeah. at books. Yeah. We discovered that as well, Susie in Marrakesh. So there's there's like a, a rising awareness of that. We went to a school to tell stories. And I was just sharing that with Mandy before we came on air. And they were so full of stories. Maria Credelli, who I love, we, we just met in Marrakesh. <laughs> and, um, you know, she's from the UK, a great storyteller and a great dancer. And we just looked at one another and said, can we hear your stories? And as such an outpouring of stories came because they haven't had a chance to tell stories in two years. Yeah. I mean, like yeah, you know, so yeah. Beautiful observation, Susie. Thank you so much, you know. So um, I'm going to Yeah, I'm going to let you back into the audience. And I, you know, this feels, you know, when we can have conversations like this, it feels a little bit like like normal again, you know, like we're in a room and I can yeah. talk to the circle and you can give me the red threads of story. So thank you so much for that, for coming in. And um, so to, there we go. And um, so uh, would anybody else like to make an observation or come in? Great, OK. <clears throat> So then talking to Susie reminded me of the red. Oh, do I see? Uh, do I, uh, see? I think Suzanne wants to. Have... She put her hand up. Is that oh, right, Suzanne? Brilliant. Thank you, Suzanne. I can only see a line, so I'm looking for Suzanne. There she is. Lovely. So hiya, lovely Suzanne. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. <laughs> Great. So I, I tell me, what, what did you enjoy about this morning? Um, it reminding me of um, taking the story for a walk. Yeah. Because uh, I, I, you know, um, used to go down um, the lane to work on my stories. Yeah. When we had a dog, we used to take the dog. Um, and then when she died, I carried on taking the stories for a walk. But um, I haven't recently because the weather's been horrible. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so yes, it's, it's reminded me that, yes, you take your story for a walk because it's, the, the animals you see as, as you walk in and the you're following a path so you you can you know the story as you're walking down the road you're unfurling a journey yeah. and then as you come back if you come back the same way then you're recapping as you come back yeah well so and then the, the story's better in your head 
I, do you know, Suzanne, when, when I, when I collect a story, when I'm doing a walking story and the story makes its way into my head, if I take that walk again, I remember where I've told that story mm -hmm. and it really gives me joy as well for the people that have heard the story. It's like, I'm taking them on the walk with me, you know? So how it's lovely. Nice, nice to practice um, with trees as an audience as well. Yes. <laughs> tell us about that, Suzanne. I agree. And I want you to tell us your lovely <laughs> wisdom on that. <laughs> well, well, down, down the lane from where is, is a tree that um, we call the whispering oak. Mm -hmm. Because when it's got leaves at the bottom and they're, they're always, it always has leaves, even though they're dry and it kind of, no matter whether there's a breeze or no breeze, they shake when you go up to it. So it's, it's a very nice tree to go in and, and, you know, you just go, hello, how are you? And it yeah. responds. And so, you know, I'm working on this story um, and it, it kind of stops and listens. It's great. So. Yeah. It's great. I and love people it. Driving past again. What the hell is she doing? I'm like, I'm <laughs> sorry to a tree. Great. Yeah. And then it's like, would you like to join me? And I'll tell the story to the tree and you can hear as well. You know, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Man. That's yeah, beautiful. Look down at the, the little church down there as well. And, the, you know, there's the fields and you can see the whole valley. And then, you know, like um, a bird will fly across and you're like, you know, I'm, do I'm not just telling this to myself. I'm not, you know, I'm telling this to the whole valley so yeah exactly that, that really helps to to get it in your head as well so oh yeah i i so agree you know we're we're tree tellers definitely suzanne i love that that's brilliant you know so uh, and it's lovely now that we we can practice to our trees but we we can tell real people again you know and this is one of the mechanisms you know i remember saint patrick's day um in 2020 and thinking we shut down three days before it. How are, we, how are we going to tell stories and who are we going to tell stories to? And look at us now, Suzanne, able to come in from the circle. It's not perfect because I missed you when I was going through my line. But how how brilliant is it that, you know, we can have this conversation, you and I now, you know, so it's really important for people. You know, we, we were beginning to get really lovely letters to Kerry Writers Museum where I'm storyteller in residence from people who've been isolated for a long time that we'd forgotten about. And they're saying this for us has been a gift because we can join you now. We can be in your Irish session, you know, mm -hmm. or people away from home who want to hear the old stories and the music. You know, it's it's a it's a real gift. So technology can be maligned. And how different is technology to talk to trees? <laughs> but we can do both. We can do both. It's lovely. Suzanne, thank you. What a lovely um, observation, you know, and great wisdom, you know, and it's really good that the wisdoms are coming in from one another, that it's not just one person that I love the circle. I can tell you do too, Suzanne. <laughs> I know we're kindred, you know, so but the, the circle is great. And this is like a great big circle this morning because I can say, this is what I want to tell you this morning about stories, but you can come in with your own wisdoms and you have Suzanne. So thank you so much. That was lovely, you know, so. Um, so uh, I'm just going to go, I, I'm going to make sure I go right down the line this time. Is, does anybody else want to come in and just share the joy of the story making? So I'm just going to go back, going through everybody. I don't see any other hands. So I'm going to carry on. So um, one of the things that was brought up there was the red thread of story and how story weaves across countries and cultures, you know. And one of the things that I find amazing, we, we have a lot of immigration into Ireland for the first time because we've been the emigrators um, but one of the ways that we communicate is to say, what is your story? You know, and there's a saying in, in my country, what's your story? What's the story? What's your story? You know, and people will tell you a little bit about themselves. Then it's a it's a great way of opening a conversation. But what I really love is when somebody tells a story and I say there's an there's an almost Irish version of that, you know, or an English version of that. And we can put the stories together or when we make our own stories, when we make sto stories are a living thing 
and they're a great vehicle of resilience. And when we make stories together, um, then that becomes our story for our time of this people. And because for the first time in the world, we can connect everywhere, we can sit with you know, all peoples for the first time in history, this is a great opportunity to make our stories and bring our stories forward. So um, we're coming up to the end. We have we've eight minutes left of the technical stuff. So I'm going to say to you that we're going to have an extra few minutes when this finishes so that I can tell you um, a visualization story because there is something about the human voice that can be very um, comforting. We tell our children's stories. We tell stories to, you know, our old people. They tell us their stories and their memories. And so it's important that we can listen to the human voice. And there is a different pace to hearing a story than there is to watching something on TV or in the cinema. You know, it's the voice that we use when we're reading books, when we're telling ourselves stories in our head. But it's a different pace and that pace is very important, the pace of stories. And it's unique to storytelling in this very fast world where we type fast, and we talk fast and there's fast food, you know, then when we listen to a story, we listen to give, we, we learn again to give our full presence to a story and to the person that's telling. And in return, we get the full attention from the teller. So it's it's lovely. It's a lovely mechanism going back and forth. So I hope you've enjoyed this morning. I feel that it was a very quick introduction to what could be a lovely storytelling circle. So if you want your own clan Shkelta, if you want your own storytelling family, all you have to do is let Mandy know, and I'm sure she'll arrange it, and you can share these beautiful stories that came this morning. So I'm going to tell you this uh, story now, and in order to do that, I invite you to find the most comfortable spot in your house. And mine is a mat that's just in front of my window and I keep a few blankets next to it and I lay down and I listen to stories um, when, when they're offered like this. So wherever is the most comfortable place for you. And then just put your feet on the ground, your heels if you're lying down, you're the soles of your feet. If you're if you're sitting, allow your belly to loosen. Allow your back to be held either by the floor or by your chair. Allow your shoulders to drop. They carry a lot of worries and responsibilities, but right now they don't have to have any of that. So allow your shoulders to drop and then allow yourself to come into a space to hear this story. So I'm going to say to you, if it's comfortable to close your eyes. And when you close your eyes, notice the color that you see behind your eyelids. Only you know what that color is. Then allow that color to become something that's dark navy blue, like velvet. In this space, notice how you can look to the right and you can look to the left. You can look above you, you can look below you, but you can see no end because in this space, it goes on forever and ever in every direction and you float in this space you float effortlessly and you begin to float away to the right hand side and as you float away you notice that a little chink of light 
comes into this navy space. And as you listen, you can hear noises outside of this building that you're in, in the outside world. Listen now to the noises in the world outside this space. Then allow yourself to come into the building, but outside of this room, this safe space that we've created, outside of this room, in this little building that you're in, what are the sounds of life that you can hear outside this room? And then allow yourself to come into this room to be in your body, to hear the sounds of your own life, the thrum of your blood, the sound of your guts, your heart beating, the sounds of your own life. And then allow yourself once more to notice this chink of light that has appeared in this navy space. You see it forming into a doorway. What is your doorway made of? Is it wood? Is it gold? What material have you used to build this door? Notice the beautiful designs that are beginning to take their place on this door. What shape is the door? Is it square? Is it rectangular? Is it arched? What kind of door have you? You begin to float up to the door and without effort, you feel a key making itself in the palm of your hand, your very own key. And with that, a lock appears in the door and your key floats up and effortlessly clicks into the lock. Click, and the door opens. And you float through so effortlessly. And as you go through, you notice the change in temperature. So warm here with a soft breeze. And on this breeze, a hint of lavender and sea salt. And then you hear it, the whoosh of the waves. Whoosh in, whoosh out, whoosh in. Your body floats over the most perfect white sand, so warm and inviting and your body finds a place to settle. You sink into the sand. It sucks you in just a little bit, molding your body and your hand begins to search the sand and you find it there, what you've been looking for, a little symbol. You take it in your hand and you feel the gratitude. Relax here now, just for a little minute. Listen to the waves. Feel the trees that are off to the right with the birds up on the top. <whistles> singing a song just for you. Nobody else has the key to this place, it's yours, yours alone. And this sand is made to mold your body, to hold you, to let you breathe. In and out. Now you feel able and you feel the call to return back home to your own life, 
without any effort, your body rises and floats back towards that beautiful door that you have made curled in the palm of your hand like a little baby holding a blanket is the symbol that you've collected from the sand and now you float through the door and you land in the navy space the door closes the key clicks and comes back into your hand to be used again whenever you need it. Notice now the sounds outside of this space in the world outside of this building. Then allow your attention to come in to this building but outside of this beautiful room the safe space that we have we have built together. What life sounds can you hear there? Then allow yourself to come into this room, to come back into your body, to notice the sounds of life from your own body, your heart, your breathing, your guts. Gently now, for we have been on a journey. Wriggle your toes to let them know that they're back here in this room. Allow that gentle movement, that little wriggle to come into your knees. Allow that small movement, that little piece of life to come into your hips. Allow that movement to travel up to your heart and into your chest to move your shoulders and your arms. Allow that movement to come into your head, gently shaking it awake. And we are back and we are together in this lovely story circle that was created by Creativity after C19 and the wonderful Mandy Dyson. So at this point, Mandy, can you stop the recording and maybe we can have a little chat? <laughs>